Thank you so much for joining us in this uh, WARA lecture series organized by the Texas WARA and Energy Institute. Uh, we are located here in the College of Engineering at the University of Texas, Permian Basin. First of all, I hope you and your family are doing well in this period of uh, global crisis. I wish you well. It is no secret that this uh, pandemic has disrupted significantly the way we live. And um, the College of Engineering, in collaboration with the COVID, 3D COVID-19 Relief Consortium here in West Texas, have been active in providing some PPEs to our first responders. And um, I would like to take this moment to thank our first responders for being there for us and also to keeping us safe. Um, the engineering building is located here in the Permian Basin, as you can see from this slide. We moved into this building about a year ago. It's a 105,000 square feet facility uh, comprising of uh, various um, programs, including mechanical engineering, petroleum engineering, chemical, and electrical. We recently added Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering. That will start in fall 2020. So we have been fortunate that we have our very strong engineering students as well as faculty. As evidence from this slide, the passing rate for our fundamental of engineering exams is 100%. Uh, we are ranked number one by US News and World Report for highest paid petroleum engineering graduates. Uh, recently, we have started the Texas Water and Energy Institute. This institute is a multidisciplinary and multi-institutional research institute that will address some of the needs for water both in the region as well as in the nation. Um, just as a, an overview, part of the effort we made during this COVID-19 was to provide a test, testing boot, as you can see from this uh, slide. So this was an effort both from the business, uh, local businesses, as well as our students and faculty to supply these uh, equipment to the hospitals. We were supported by various uh, groups, private businesses. So in terms of the um, what we are doing in the college also, this equipment here is a scanning electron microscopy coupled with uh, energy dispersive uh, spectrometer uh, for detection of uh, contaminants, both in produced water as well as in um, drinking and municipal water. So water is one of the major challenges, as you know. The water has been identified as one of the grand challenges of the 21st century by the National Academy of Engineers. So just like the pandemic we are dealing with here on a global scale, WARA is also a major concern on global scale. So we have developed the WARA lecture series here at the Texas WARA and Energy Institute in order to bring together the community, practitioners, the industries, the academics, to meet together in this forum to discuss some of the issues and challenges about war. So today, we are very fortunate to have Mr. Gerardo Rivera um, to give a presentation here on uh, water midstream sector uh, as it relates to ESG. Uh, Mr. Rivera 
has uh, 34 years of domestic and international experience in the energy sector, including 23 years with Conoco Phillips. Also at Conoco Phillips, Mr. Gerardo had management assignments in the upstream as well as in the midstream sector with exposure to multiple commodities. So he's currently a vice president at H2O Midstreams. So today we will hear from him on the midstreams as well as um, his relationship with the ESG. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Girardo. Thank you, Dr. Nana, for the invitation. I want to thank the UTPB for um, the opportunity to speak to you today about ESG and water midstream. Um, as Dr. Nana said earlier, we're operating under very uh, difficult times um, with the COVID virus and the impact that uh, the change in the market has had uh, into crude oil prices and in our industry. So I want to cover a few items uh, today. Um, when I was asked to make this presentation, the subject was headlined as water midstream and ESG. And as I thought about it, I decided I wanted to switch it from um, water midstream and ESG to ESG and, and water midstream. So with that, I'll begin. <clears throat> I'm going to cover three areas. The first is ESG investing, what that means and what it is. Uh, what the water midstream sector, which is a relatively new sector in the oil and gas business. And then I'll talk about H2O and what we've done with respect to um, uh, ESG activities in, in our business. So what is ESG investing? <clears throat> it goes under a couple of different names. Um, I've seen the term called socially responsible investing, and that's where people make investments based on social issues that matter to them. Uh, there might be things that they care about or maybe they things that they don't agree with and they want to avoid those investments. That's been around for a number of years, uh, more, more than uh, more than the last 50 years. It's been around for, for a long time. Another term that's used is sustainable investing. Uh, <clears throat> and the earliest uh, reference I could find to sustainable investing goes back to 1971 a mutual fund called Pax World launched a mutual fund that was based on sustainable investments in certain areas and avoiding other areas as well. And they've been around for over 50 years. Today, um, over the last five to 10 years, there's been a big focus on ESG, where ESG is environmental, social, and governance. And that's where I'm going to talk about in that area as well. So whatever you call this, it's, it, it is based on what your core values are. And uh, I want to talk about those later on, so remember that. <clears throat> so ESG, this has been something that's uh, been picked up in the industry here over the last few years. This graph over on the uh, left-hand column is the amount of dollars that are invested in um, ESG type investments. So the line here uh, translates to the left-hand side. So roughly about $30 billion were assets under management uh, that were related to ESG type investments. And you can see it's really started to ramp up here in 2013. Uh, but the note here is highlighting that over the last two years, uh, the growth in or the net inflows into ESG types of investments grew more than four times in 2019 versus 2018. And you can see that dramatic jump. The the, the bars represent the net inflows or in years 2011, 2012 net outflows into ESG type investments. And you can see there's been a dramatic jump there. So today we're looking at about $150 billion in funds that are focused on uh, ESG. <clears throat> so what is water midstream? I mentioned earlier, um, this is a fairly new sector in the oil and gas uh, industry. And uh, it's a little bit different, <clears throat> but it's mo modeled after um, something that's been around for a while. So uh, everyone I think is familiar with the typical two terms re referred to in the oil and gas business. Uh, you have the upstream sector, which is the exploration and production of oil and gas. Um, last year, 2019, we produced in the US um, just over 12 million barrels of oil per day. 
Uh, that was a record for the U.S. Um, just to put things in perspective, uh, before the shale boom came along, the U.S. was probably producing uh, four to five thousand, four to five million barrels a day, and was on decline. Uh, there was a significant jump up to the 10 million barrel a day range uh, in 2015, 2016. There was a downturn in the industry. Um, there was a recovery, and uh, volumes increased up to 12 and a half million barrels a day. Today following both the uh, COVID pandemic and the um, price war going on with OPEC and other non-OPEC countries, uh, we've seen a dramatic drop in pricing and production, um, which has impacted our business. But that's known as the upstream sector. The downstream sector, people are more familiar with as well. That's the refining and distribution and marketing of finished products that come out of uh, their products that are result from crude oil. Um, namely gasoline, but also jet fuel, diesel, and feedstocks in the chemical plants. <clears throat> in between, you have the gathering and processing of gas and also gathering and storage and distribution of crude oil. That has evolved to be known as what's called the midstream business. And that business is very well defined. And, uh, you know, the, the most common is the gathering and processing sector, which is gathering and processing gas, uh, transportation of gas, storage of gas, gas treating, uh, all of that falls under that midstream sector. It also includes crude oil, gathering, storage, and distribution, and refined product storage. That's the midstream sector. So people understand that when you talk about <clears throat> what is upstream, what is downstream, what is midstream. What's come about lately is new is the water midstream business. And again, while we produce a little over 12 million barrels a day, or we're producing 12 million barrels a day in the U.S., <clears throat> excuse me, we were also producing roughly 50 million barrels a day of water that has to be gathered, transported, and disposed of, or treated and recycled. That industry has evolved as the, the shale industry has grown and taken off. So that, that part of it is what we call water midstream, and I'll talk a little bit more of that as we go into the presentation. Um, first of all, let me take another step back into the upstream sector and talk about what the water life cycle looks like. So uh, when a producer starts to develop a field using um, a shale field using hydraulic fracking, they usually begin with fresh water <clears throat> and they use that to uh, fracture the wells and stimulate them to initiate flow. There's an initial flow back, and that water is water that can either be disposed of in an SWD or recycled for reuse in hydraulic fracking again. <clears throat> Once that initial frac flow back is complete and you have what you have breakthrough, you start producing the producers, the operator starts to produce both hydrocarbons and water. Those are separated. That produced water, again, can be. Um, either injected and disposed of into a saltwater disposal well, or it can be recycled back, treated, and used for hydraulic fracking again. So again, so that's that, that shows you what the life cycle is for water in the upstream sector. If we look at the history of uh, the water midstream business, initially it initially started in phase one, what we call shale water 1.0. And at that point, um, water was not really a midstream sector. It was something that fell under oil field services. Typically what you have is the dot represents a well. Uh, water would get trucked to that well, it would get fracked, and water would trucked away to here by this diamond, which represents a saltwater disposal well. It was pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, not very well integrated, and it was just a service sector of taking water from um, from the well head to and from the well and down to a disposal well. Uh, as the shale industry started to evolve and grow, uh, they started developing large pads or uh, drilling wells in, in, in bunches. And you've had different well pads that would tie into, more than one well pad would tie into a saltwater disposal well. That evolved where it started to become a little more integrated, where a producer might have multiple well pads that tie into multiple uh, uh, saltwater disposal wells. And again, you know, in terms of the volume of water has grown significantly. 
um, in the old oil business where it was conventional drilling and, and completion, they might use 30,000 barrels to drill a well. Today, it can be anywhere from three to 700,000 barrels a well to drill and frack and complete a well before it comes online. The amount of water that was being produced per well was in the hundreds of barrels a day per well, whereas now initial flow rate is anywhere from four to 6,000 barrels a day of water uh, for just one well. So it's a significantly much larger volume that needs to be managed in the system. So, so the next step is where we are today. We like to call it shale 4.0. And for those of you that follow the upstream sector, which is much closer there in the Permian Basin, um, you know that the upstream sector has evolved over time and has built in efficiencies in how they do their business. The same is happening on the midstream side. And so this model, uh, and I'll talk about it more when I talk about the history of H2O, uh, it's bringing the, um, the mentality and the philosophy of the midstream sector into the water business. And it's talking about running more of an integrated system where you have multiple SWDs represented by these uh, wellheads, multiple well pads that feed into that system. Uh, we can store water, we can recycle water, we can add fresh water. Uh, these represent ponds where if you have more salt water that you need to dispose of, then the wells can handle, you can temporarily put it in, in ponds, you can store it in ponds and re-deliver it to a recycle facility um, and deliver it back for frack needs. So it's more of a, an integrated approach, taking in each of the steps or each of the, what's known as the value chain of midstream, where there's gathering, distribution, uh, source water, recycling, and disposal. So let's talk a little bit about H2O midstream. Um, H2O was founded in 2016. Um, our initial assets were acquired in 2017. We've been operating since then uh, in Howard County. Um, our assets are located in the northern sector of Howard County, just west of uh, Midland, Odessa. Um, we started out with, uh, with less than 100 million, 100 million, I'm sorry, 100 miles of pipeline. We've grown that to over 200 miles of pipeline. We own and operate 15 saltwater disposal wells. We have access to third party saltwater disposal wells as well. Uh, we've got multiple permits in place to grow our system. Uh, our volume started off um, uh, and grown to uh, over 100,000 barrels a day uh, on the system. Uh, Howard County is one of the more uh, prolific areas in terms of, of shale play and the formation there. Um, there's over 5,000 drillable locations within a five mile radius of our system. Um, we have two large uh, producers that are baseload customers. Uh, one is in Canada, which is now known as Ovintiv, and then Sabalo, a private company as well. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a very strong area in terms of the uh, the rock and the hydrocarbon potential, and we've developed a pretty strong position there, and that we're, we're an integrated facility there. Uh, and and before I move on, the history of H2O. Our initial founders were Jim Summers, uh, Daryl Bull, and um, Stephen McNair. Uh, Jim Summers and Stephen and myself, our background is we both, we, all three of us started working for Conoco in the midstream business. It was the gas gathering and processing. At that time, it was not called the midstream business. It was simply called uh, natural gas and gas products. And, but we were, that department was responsible for gathering, processing, treating natural gas. Uh, we had NGLs that, that are produced in our gas plants, fractionation, transportation, storage. Uh, we had gas purchasing, gas sales, NGL purchasing, NGL sales. It was what was known as a fully integrated business. Um, it was not called a midstream, it was just called gas gathering and processing. Over time, that has evolved to a separate industry, which was essentially what we call the midstream today. So Stephen, Jim and myself and Daryl as well, we come from a background of gas gathering and processing in the midstream sector. So we think of things in that way and we've taken that philosophy and applied it to water. 
So in H2O, I mentioned earlier, we've applied that philosophy of the midstream sector being fully integrated, um, being involved in each sector of the gap of the water business, which is again gathering, transporting, storing, disposing of, treating, uh, and fresh water, and providing it for uh, frac hydraulic fracturing. So we're involved in each of those steps of, of the value chain for water. Um, the company's built on a, on, on, a, on a vision and values and core values. Um, we have strength and focus on, on logistics, on commercial and engineering. Uh, we pride ourselves in, in the safety design of our facilities, and we take into account protecting the environment as well. Uh, we're, we're heavy in data analytics and, and operating our system to optimize it, not just for uh, economic basis, but also for what the impact is to the environment and keeping safety first. So our core values, we use this acronym called GREAT. Um, our core values are gravitas, which is we're drawn to people of excellence and we're committed to excellence. Uh, we, we like to show that and, and attract the best people to work for us and uh, attract the customers based on our experience and knowledge. Uh, we're reliable. One of the things that's most important in this sector is that we provide reliable service to our customers. Um, we're always there and we want to have a high um, on-time rate. Uh, we pride ourselves that we get a 99.9% uh, on-time delivery rate in terms of providing service to our customers. Um, ethics. We're very ethical and uh, want to operate in an ethical manner. And that goes back to the ESG concept. So remember that as well. I mentioned we're highly analytical. We do a lot of data analysis and optimization of our facilities. Again, you'll see later on that ties into what we talk about in terms of ESG opportunities. And transparency, again, we're very transparent with our customers, our stakeholders, uh, our shareholders, and all of the government agencies that we deal with. So where does ESG and water midstream meet? So I'm gonna talk about our specific operations and some opportunities where we actually tie those two together. Um, there's a paper and I've, I've got a reference to it at the very end that uh, our CEO and founder, Jim Summers wrote earlier this year, uh, I think it's called the uh, Blues, the New Green, where water meets ESG. And he talks about when he found the, founded the company, he had underlying principles of applying ESG, but he didn't make that a core focus of his selling point of the company. Um, and it was until we started operating and showing, uh, building our facilities and building our system, it was then that people realized that, hey, wait a minute, there is, there is the ability to incorporate ESG into the oil and gas business. So going back, I've talked a little bit about these things earlier, but in terms of the shale res revolution and the boom that we've seen in the oil and gas business with shale, um, here you see the amount of water that's used for fracking wells and how that's grown from 2014 to 2019. Um, this chart right here shows the number of freshwater wells that are being drilled in the different uh, shale areas, uh, Permian being the largest of them all, Eagleford, Haynesville, and, and the Burnett as well. So you can see there was a, a dramatic growth in freshwater wells. This was the downturn in 2014-15. It was an upward tra 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 trajectory, I'm sorry, uh, and a lot of growth in, in water demand, freshwater demand for fracking. The other big change is the growth in water production associated with oil and gas. It's significantly higher today in, um, in, in the shale business than it is in conventional oil. So the first proposition has to do with uh, taking, if you recall the earlier diagram where we showed the old conventional business was taking produced water by truck and trucking it to the site. Uh, uh, when you transport water by truck, uh, the truck is uh, traveling over the highway consuming diesel, generating a, a number of, of CO2 emissions that are added in, into the atmosphere. As I mentioned earlier, there's roughly 50 million barrels of produced water that's being produced in the oil and gas business. If it took uh, one truck 30 miles of trip each way, 
the amount of CO2 that it produces, uh, diesel produces. If we could take all of those barrels off of trucks and put them in a pipeline, it would eliminate 36 billion tons a year of CO2. So getting uh, trucks off the road and using pipeline to transport water has a significant impact to CO2 emissions. Some other comparisons are um, uh, in terms of renewable, 76 million megawatt hours at 47 tons. So if you were using something like a solar or wind power and generating that much, um, it's equal to 100% of all the solar power in the US. In terms of electric vehicles, 7 million cars, it would be 20 times the number of cars that are being sold that were sold in 2019 to offset what we can offset by taking water out of trucks and into pipeline. So what has H2O done? Um, in 2018, we opened up what was called a truck free water disposal facility. Uh, it's the Newton Hub located there in Howard County. This facility has uh, two saltwater disposal wells, uh, has two um, storage ponds that total a million barrels a day of storage, and uh, all of the water that we take in there comes in via pipeline. We don't take any trucks at all. So eliminating all those trucks, we estimate has reduced emissions by over 144,000 tons a year. Uh, that's equivalent to a utility-sized solar facility of 150 megawatts. In addition to the reduction in CO2 emissions, it also has a, a, a big impact on safety. Uh, the incident rate per year for trucks versus pipeline is much, much higher. You can see the statistics here. Uh, the, the fatalities per year associated with trucks is 10.2 versus pipeline 1.7. So it's much, much, much safer to transport uh, water by, by pipeline than it is by truck, in addition to the impact it has to reduce CO2 emissions. So that's one example. Next one, um, value proposition number two, produce water recycling. Um, Dr. Nan mentioned earlier about the importance of water on a global basis. Uh, almost a billion people lack basic access to basic drinking water. That's uh, one in every 10 million, every ten, one in 10 people on this planet. Uh, two thirds of the population lives in zones that have water scarcity. So globally, uh, we have a responsibility to take care of our water resource needs on a global basis. Anything we can do to recycle water and limit the amount of fresh water that we're generating or producing uh, will add a benefit to a society. Earlier, I've talked a couple of times and I think everyone knows this. Um, this is a, a graph that was put together by Bridget Scanlon. She's uh, from the University of Texas Bureau of uh, Economic Theology. And what this has, there's, there's a lot of big numbers on here, but um, She's showing the number of wells in the Delaware Basin. This is the potential. All locations are all wells that could be drilled in the Delaware, Delaware Basin. There's over 207,000 wells. In the Midland Basin, there's 113,000 wells that could be drilled. When you drill those wells, they're going to produce a significant number of barrels. And this is 247 billion barrels of water over the line. In addition to the amount of water that they're going to produce, there's amount of water that needs to be used for fracking. So just under 68 billion barrels would need to be used for fracking those 207,000 wells just in the Delaware Basin. And that's what these other numbers represent here. In the middle of the basin, there, we've identified 113,000 wells. Um, they would produce over 60, million, 60 billion barrels of water over the lifetime of the field. Um, in addition to that, it would need uh, just under 47 billion barrels of water to frack those. If we can take produced water, treat it, and use it for fracking, that will significantly um, reduce the amount of fresh water that has to be drilled for, for fracking. So earlier this year, H2O uh, commissioned, uh, put in service a recycling facility it's called the El Dorado Recycling Facility. It has capacity of 40,000 barrels a day. 
which is the equivalent of 670 million gallons a year. To put that in perspective, that would meet the water needs in the U.S. of about 17,000 people. Globally, it would, it could, it's the equivalent of water needs for over 280,000 people. Again, recycling produced water for fracking reduces the, the amount of fresh water that's needed, which keeps that water in the ground for uses later on down the road. Uh, Simmons Energy, one of the local, or I'm sorry, one of the investment banks here in the U.S. estimate if we could just take half of that water demand for fracking, which they were estimating on an annual basis, 4.8 billion barrels, if we could just do half, the amount of water that we uh, keep in the ground for later use could provide water to 2.8 million people in the U.S. or 46 million globally. So anything we can do to recycle water, limit the amount of fresh water that we're using is obviously a benefit to the environment and to society. The last one's a little more complicated and it has to do with as the industry gets mature, you'll see improvements um, in the cycle and how we do business. Uh, this right here is a graph showing an example is oil tanker spills from 1970 to 2018. And if you look back in the decades of the 70s, that though over that 10 year period, we averaged about 24 and a half spills per year um, in the industry. Um, that was too high. Uh, the industry started to focus on safety and those number of spills were cut in more by less than half uh, in the decades of the 80s and those declines to continued over time so in the the last most recent decade of 2010 to 2018 spills are, are less than one one per one tenth of what they were um, in in the 70s and again that's as the industry grows, as, as it becomes mature, it, it finds ways to do things better. An example of that on the midstream side is being integrated. Again, we talked about how in, in shale wells, how they behave. When you frack a well, there's an initial huge peak of water that's produced. Within 60 days, that volume declines by 30 to 40% and then another 60 days is down by 50% and then it flattens out. So what happens is if you look at it on an individual basis, the amount of water that one has to, to dispose of for one well has a very high peak. And that's what's shown on this graph here, a very high peak. If each producer were to, de to develop uh, water handling facilities for just their peak, we'd have an enormous excess amount of capacity out there. By having the midstream companies come in and full, fulfill that need, they can build a system out to reduce the amount of, of wells that are needed to handle that volume and utilize that excess capacity. And the way we do this is we use what's called a dispatch model. And, and that's very similar to what they do in the electricity, the power system. When they buy electricity to meet your needs in, in the area, um, they buy first the, the lowest cost electricity, and as demand goes up, they buy the next highest cost, and as demand goes up, they buy the next highest cost. And you have what's called peak shaving power plants, which are only used a short amount of time during those peaks. Well, we've done the same thing on water disposal. We have uh, 15 owned and operated saltwater disposal wells that we use that provide service to the baseline. We have underground, we have above ground storage. I mentioned earlier, we have a million barrels of storage at the Newton hub that we can take water into the, the, into the ponds uh, when, the, when the saltwater disposal wells are being fully utilized. That provides some peak peaking capacity. And then for that super peaking capacity, we have access to third party SWDs. These are owned by other companies. Um, we have the ability to deliver water to them and utilize their capacity. So it goes back to that, that diagram that I showed earlier, um, where we show a, an integrated network. So we have a, an integrated pipeline system connected to several producers taking water some of these, if you think of some of these as third party facilities that we're going to, 
we're utilizing excess capacity rather than building new facilities. It's optimizing the capacity that's out there and minimizing the footprint that is uh, required for disposing of water in the industry. So again, that's that's a concept that we brought to this sec this industry into the water midstream sector. Whereas before, uh, in shale 1.0, it was uh, drill one saltwater disposal well to handle my 100,000 barrel a day peak, and the guy next door drilled a SWD system to handle his peak. And then you have a, a series of peaks of uh, capacity that far exceeds what the need is. This is optimizing capacity that's out there and minimizing the footprint onto the environment. So uh, I'm going to wrap things up here. The this is this is looking back in the industry uh, transformations that occurred. The natural gas business was once a fully regulated pipeline business that was regulated by the government integrated from beginning to end and uh, it limited the ability to optimize the system. Uh, back in the 70s they started deregulating the system and it's opened up opportunities to optimize the capacity, minimize the footprint and the impact on the environment and fully utilize capacity uh, there. The same has happened in power um, and then the same is happening with renewals, renewables like solar and wind power. Uh, now that that's deregulated moving forward, people are using um, optimization techniques to help better utilize the assets that are out there. And water, we believe, is the next step, is, uh, is the next sector which will evolve and follow that same uh, philosophy and structure in terms of growth. Um, that's all I have here. Uh, Jim Summers, our founder, he likes to end uh, his presentations with a quote. So I borrowed one here from Steve Jobs. Uh, everyone knows uh, he uh, was the founder and, and, and brainchild behind Apple and all the advances we have in technology um, um, with phones and, and all the other electronic devices that Apple has invented. Uh, he said that people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do so. Uh, so when it comes to ESG, most people or a lot of people think, well, how do you take into account uh, uh, the environment when you're drilling wells and, and the answer is you can and there are well ways to manage both um, drilling and producing oil oil and gas and the water associated with it and protect the environment and society at the same time. So uh, that wraps up my presentation. Uh, thank you very much Dr. Nana. If there's any questions I'll, I'll open it up there. Well, thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, you're, on, you're still on mute, Dr. Nana. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, the floor is open now, you know, for questions. Maybe I can, um, I can begin. Uh, the uh, question that I have is, is Is it better? No, you on mute. Okay. The okay. I'm sorry. Okay. The question that I have is you getting water from different suppliers. Yes. How do you control the quality? in terms of pricing because you're getting different water qualities and that will pose different challenges for you. How is so, it? So what we do is in our contract that we do with the, the different producers, we establish a water quality specification and uh, the producer is required to meet that water quality specification. That way, all of the water that we take into our system, there's not a great deal of variation between the water quality. So if one producer has water that has a much lower quality, then it is his responsibility to treat that before delivering it into our system. Okay. You mentioned about the, uh, 
uh, integrated net. Is there potential for leakage along the piping network? And how do you detect that? You're, you're muted. <laughs> I guess we're still getting used to this new era of uh, online uh, uh, discussions here. Uh, yeah, so we we follow this again the same principles that might be in a gas gathering or gas distribution network or a, an NGL crude network. We monitor our system based on pressures and monitor that for leaks. So we generate what's called an, a normal pressure operating profile, and we're monitoring that with a SCADA system to determine if there's any any anomalies in terms of the pressures that would indicate a leak. We also measure volume at different sectors within our system, and that's another way to determine if there's a leak. We do a, an online system balance, uh, like our meters may show, indicate that we have 100,000 barrels coming onto the system, and then we have meters that measure how much is leaving it, and we make sure that those numbers are in check. So we'll, we apply the same principles that you would if you were had a, a gas system in terms of monitoring and uh, leak detection or liquid system as well. Okay. Again, it's, it's bringing the traditional midstream business uh, principles um, and best practices to play in the water business as well. Absolutely. Uh, Sarah, are there yeah. any hands? Are there any are questions, there questions from the audience? audience? Yes, yes, I do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, the first one asks, uh, can you comment on environmental environment environment and quality, quality for strategy? strategy. I'm, I'm sorry, you broke up on that question. Can you say it again? Yes, yes. So, so can you comment on the industrial requirement, requirement volume, the quality, treatment strategy? strategy? Okay, in terms of quality um, for fracking, uh, that varies from producer to producer, and that has been changing over time. Uh, we've seen producers uh, evolve in terms of water quality for fracking. Uh, we've seen them go from they want 100% of fresh water only for fracking to a 70-30 mix, a 50-50 mix, and down now there's producers that take 100% produced water that's been recycled and uh, <clears throat> delivered to them for fracking uh, their wells. And then in terms of how much treating they need or ask for and recycling, that has evolved as well. Uh, some producers want an extensive amount of treating Others want to, uh, there, there's a few minimum that, that they all request, and that is a reduction of uh, any uh, free hydrocarbons and then no H2S. Uh, some producers might want to limit uh, the amount of, of um, total dissolved solids and total suspended solids. Um, but the key ones seem to be uh, they want zero H2S or free hydrocarbons. Okay, so the next question is, um, thank you for the great presentation. What kind of technical challenges have you had so far? Probably the biggest challenge is produced water is uh, highly corrosive. So dealing with um, handling a corrosive uh, uh, product is, is the big challenge. Um, <clears throat> in our piping systems, we use a combination of polyethylene pipe, HDPE, um, internally coated carbon steel and stainless steel, uh, and we've utilized fiberglass pipe as well. Uh, it's been a challenge finding the right um, mix and combination of, of piping to use within our facilities. Um, each one has its advantages and disadvantages, um, and they, they all create some challenges. So dealing with the cor corrosivity, corrosive, corrosiveness of water, and uh, managing our pipeline systems. That's a big one. Uh, 
OK, I think that is all the questions we have right now. Are you still on mute, Dr. Nana? Could you comment on the data analytics um, portion? You mentioned that the data analytics is a big part of your core values. So when you're talking about the data analytics, uh, how does that feed in? Is it in terms of the quantity of water or quality or water chemistry? How does that feed in into the core value of our H2O industry? I'll, I'll give you an example of um, something that just recently occurred. Um, one of our, our pumps that we have at one of our facilities used for um, uh, pumping increase in water pressure for disposal. Uh, we track the uh, volume that, that goes through that pump um, uh, on a cumulative basis, and uh, we monitor the vibration associated with that pump. And what we found is uh, this pump, the vibration level was starting to increase, and we, uh, we, we shut the pump down, did an inspection, and we realized it was time to overhaul that pump uh, because uh, there had been some um, uh, decomposition of the pump because of the high, highly corrosive water that we're dealing with. And what we did is we looked at the total volume that had passed through that pump and the level of vibration was increasing over time. And we found that um, it was it was under the uh, it was right on track of the expected life cycle of that pump. So by monitoring the volume that goes through and the level of vibration, that gives us a clue of when that pump will need to be replaced or overhauled. And that was that's an example of, of data analytics uh, by measuring two factors, both volume through the pump and vibration on the pump. That gives gives us an indication of when we need to take that pump down and overhaul it or replace it, as opposed to waiting for the pump to break and disrupting our operations. Uh, that, that's one example of the analytics. The other is uh, we use pumps to move water across our system and there's a cost associated with disposing water in our different uh, SMDs. Uh, some are lower cost than others. If we can uh, run a pump to move water to a lower cost facility and the cost of that pump is less than the incremental cost of the more expensive SMD, we use that to monitor and move water in the most uh, cost efficient manner. So we look at cost or incremental cost, whether it's running a pump uh, or the cost associated with the facility um, and monitor those numbers and optimize our facility in that way. Okay, well, that's great. We do they have another question. Um, they are asking what kind of treatment technologies were you using to remove H2S and other others in order to meet the fracking needs? Um, fortunately, we have not had um, any H2S issues that we've had to treat in the past, but uh, there are a number of, of commercial oper uh, commercial services, uh, chemical based services that you can uh, utilize to treat the water. Uh, we have not come across uh, um, any H2S issues, issues within our, our system so far, but we have looked at that in the case that we do need to, but there, there are several um, chemical treatments that are available for uh, knocking H2S out of the water. Okay. Sarah, do you have any more questions? Uh, that is all that I have that have come in so far. Okay. Well, we still have a few more minutes here for questions. Um, one thing I want to say is that um, this presentation is very informative and uh, ESG is one of the major areas of emphasis, you know, not only in the uh, mainstream business, but in other sectors as well. You know, so we really appreciate this opportunity that uh, Mr. Rivera has provided us, you know, to inform us on what is going on. I think integrated uh, midstream is really the way to go, you know, moving forward. Our next presentation 
is on the 24th, is going to focus on short treatment trains for produced water reclamation and reuse. That will be presented by Professor Zahi Kat from the Colorado School of Mines. It will be at the same time on Friday, the 24th. So, Anna, we did just get two more questions if good. you'd like to have some. Sure. So the first one is, you mentioned water has been received from different producers and there is a water quality standard that needs to be adhered to. Does H2O analyze the water received to identify the various constituents present and how these mixtures influence the cohesiveness of the water? Yes, so um, we, we have um, we, we have various points where we will pull samples on a regular basis and do an analysis to make sure that um, the water is within the spec that we've laid out. Uh, the other thing we do is we'll, we'll pull samples throughout our system that will identify where we need to inject chemicals to help um, dissolve any solids buildup and avoid solids builds up. Uh, probably the biggest issue or concern we have is uh, solid builds up. Uh, which is a function of uh, both the hydrocarbon content and, and the ATP as well, which can lead to um, um, the formation of solids. So we'll measure those things throughout the system. We take uh, we have a regular testing system or protocol or program in place. Um, we go out and pull samples at different points and we'll assess it and see where we're doing. One thing that we don't have is uh, Again, going back to the, the, the traditional conventional midstream business, at least on the gas processing side. Typically, you'll have either an online gas chromatograph that is continuously reading what the gas quality is. And if there's any concerns with gas qualities, it can, be, it can notify the producer and the midstream company, and if necessary, shut in that particular well. Uh, the other thing that typically we do in the midstream sector is we have what's called composite samplers that uh, let's say you have a, uh, a source that's flowing X barrels per day. Uh, it will pull a small slipstream sample of that uh, over the monthly period and it will accumulate what's called a composite sample and then you'll run analysis on that sample. The water sector has not evolved to that, that uh, level of sophistication yet, but there are some tools where we can water uh, we can monitor things easily like pH, turbidity. Um, there's an indirect way to monitor uh, TSS, uh, and then uh, it takes a little more work to, to monitor uh, hydrocarbon content. But that's that's an area where there's some room for uh, the industry to mature and, and grow further. Okay, the next question is, any issues with overpressure in SWDs? In disposal, yeah. Uh, no, that's the other thing is uh, when we talk about data monitoring, data analytics, we monitor our injection pressure, uh, both in the tubing side for disposal into the wells and on the casing side as well. Um, and if we see any anomalies there, we can take action there. Uh, one thing that we do find is over time, uh, you will see pressure start to increase uh, in, in the disposal, in the SWD, the saltwater disposal well. And uh, what we do to treat that is uh, is uh, do what we call an acid job, where you inject inject a, a, a significant volume of acid to help wash out the the tubing and the formation to to reduce the pressure and increase the flow. Okay, that is all the questions we have come in so far. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we have a few more minutes uh, for questions. Just on a general comment, what is the impact of this pandemic and also the um, economic downturn on the uh, mainstream business? Uh, that's a good question. And that was one of the things I thought about adding to the presentation. Um, it's certainly in uh, the headlines today, uh, the, 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 what we call the double whammy that the industry has taken on 
back in March when, or actually February, when the pandemic started to evolve initially uh, overseas, um, it first came to the U.S. around the March timeframe, if I remember correctly, and that's where it became concern and uh, it hit certain areas uh, earlier and a little bit harder than did other areas within the country. Um, around the same time, OPEC and uh, a couple of non-OPEC nations, namely Russia, had gotten together. They had a dispute over over production quotas and prices. And the same time the pandemic was hitting uh, globally, uh, OPEC decided they were going to produce more oil uh, than they had been. Um, so in and of itself, um, OPEC and uh, non-OPEC countries agreeing to increase production uh, would have a, a, a negative impact to crude oil prices, and it did. On top of that, you had the pandemic, um, which led to uh, uh, countries across the globe, uh, sh what we call sheltering in place or social isolate isolation, um, which reduced dramatically the demand of oil and oil products. Um, <clears throat> In terms of the, the magnitude, roughly the world was pre-pandemic, pre-OPEC, the world was consuming 100 million barrels of oil today. Uh, throughout the world, uh, there was 100 million barrels that was being produced and consumed. That was the balance. When the pandemic hit and countries started um, limiting and restricting uh, movement and, and, and practicing social isolation, the demand dropped anywhere from 20 to 25 percent. So we went from consuming 100 million barrels a day to 75 million barrels a day. That's 25 percent uh, reduction in crude oil demand uh, globally. So when we think about the U.S., um, a, a couple of responses that happened. One was uh, OPEC, um, after agreeing to raise production, agreed to cut production uh, just under 10 million barrels a day, which is a dramatic cut in prices, but it's half of what we needed to cut. There was a long debate going on in the U.S., specifically in Texas, whether we should curtail production, whether the government should mandate curtailing production. Uh, the thing is, globally, I mean, as I mentioned, throughout the U.S., our total U.S. production was peaked at just over, just under 13 million barrels a day. Even if we cut 100% of that, it would not have been enough to get things back in check. And then there was a big debate of, well, who cuts first and where do we cut? Uh, there was a big discussion here in Texas at the Railroad Commission about curtailing production. We can't look at it on, on an isolated basis. We have to look at it on, on a, on, on a na nationwide basis. And um, so what happened is uh, a lot of countries um, cut production. Um, producers individually did their own assessment and decided to curtail production. And then the balance of production went into uh, uh, storage facilities. And um, I just saw about two weeks ago uh, the EIA International the, or the NHL. Energy Information Agency uh, publishes data on, 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 on the industry in terms of production storage and, and inventories and inventories grew at the highest level since in, in since they started reporting, I think in 1920. Uh, so our, our volumes in storage have grown to about 90% uh, capacity and then um, refining, um, the refining feedstocks dropped about 30%. Um, I just saw uh, a note from EIA this morning that said uh, in the U.S. gasoline production is at pre-COVID levels, which sounds good, but it's at pre-COVID levels, but it's well below where it normally is in the summertime. In the summertime here in the U.S., gasoline demand goes way up because people are driving on vacation. Obviously, people aren't doing that. So while product the, or gasoline consumption demand has increased, it is still below where it normally is. Uh, and then the other big uh, consumer of petroleum products is uh, jet fuel. Um, um, airline travel is still down, I think, more than 50%. So that has had a, a big impact on consumption. So uh, the uh, OPEC-Russia relationship 
had a negative impact in terms of supply. Uh, the pandemic had a negative impact in terms of consumption. You put those two together, we've seen the impact in terms of crude oil prices, which were running on the 50 to $60 range in January, February, uh, reached the low of uh, actually one day on the New York uh, Mercantile Exchange, uh, actually closed uh, in negative territory, first time ever. Um, but we have seen a rebound. Um, we're hovering around $40 a barrel. Um, the industry seems to think that uh, the, the balancing point is somewhere to $40, $40 $50. Uh, we'll need to see a, a continued recovery in demand uh, before we see some stability on the, on the crude oil price. Obviously, that's had a big impact on, uh, on crude oil activity or drilling and, and, and exploration activity in the U.S. Um, uh, the, drink, the drilling rig count, which is tracked by Baker Hughes, um, I think is down to 265 rigs running in the U.S., which is down uh, from uh, beginning of the year. I think we were around 800 rigs running. So a very, very dramatic drop in activity in the oil and gas business. So um, it's been a, a double impact. Um, I think one of those events would have certainly had a negative impact on the sector. Two of them um, uh, put us in a place where um, the industry's never been. <clears throat> I've been in the oil and gas business now 35 years. I've, I've gone through a lot of ups and downs. Um, this was uh, probably uh, uh, something that no one ever imagined would occur. Okay, we have a couple more questions that come in if you'd like to stay um, or if you need to go. I'm not sure about your schedule. Uh, I have uh, another 15 minutes I can do. Okay. So the next question is, what kind of precautions were you taking to reduce the corrosion? So uh, again, we'll use uh, some, we use some um, chemicals based corrosion inhibitors. Uh, the other thing is we uh, we used a lot of polyethylene pipe in the gathering and, and transportation of our of our salt water. So the the poly pipe, of course, is um, is not corrosive to the salt uh, <clears throat> or the the high salinity in the produced water. Where we run into issues are, is around our saltwater disposal wells. And again, we've used a combination of, um, of uh, fiberglass pipe, polyethylene pipe, stainless steel pipe, and uh, internally coated carbon steel pipe um, uh, to minimize the uh, impact of the corrosivity of the, the produced water. Okay, the next question is, in monitoring the pipe pressure data, do you also collect or register the data gotten from the water analyst in terms of acceptable um, concentration of various um, constituents. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, industry has not evolved to that level of sophistication. So no, we're, we're not getting data live online tied into our SCADA system to monitor the water quality. The water quality is, is measured or um, checked by spot sampling throughout the system uh, on a regular basis. But it's we don't have live data like we do um, in, 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 in the gas gathering and processing sector. Okay, we had another question come in. It says, what is the average lifetime of a saltwater disposal well? Um, I don't know if there's an average. Uh, we've got some wells that were originally drilled as producers and converted to disposal wells uh, going back to the 80s uh, that are still in service. And uh, we have uh, drilled three new wells and placed them in service in the past two years. So we haven't determined what the life cycle is yet. Um, it's the reverse of a producing well where a reservoir engineer goes in and assesses how many hydrocarbons are in the well uh, and they estimate the life of that well based on their estimation of the hydrocarbons that you can pull from that. Whereas on our side, um, we're injecting water into a reservoir, primarily the Ellenberger, um, and and we're, we're going to continue to uh, dispose of in that well until we reach pressure that's no longer economic. Uh, so we haven't seen that full life cycle yet. 
Yeah. Okay, we don't have any more questions right now. Well, let us thank uh, Mr. Rivera uh, for this excellent presentation. And just uh, another reminder, there's another presentation that is coming up on, on the 24th by uh, Professor Kath, focusing on uh, treatment trends for produced water treatment. So we would also like to uh, thank H2O Midstreams for this opportunity and also the Texas Water and Energy Institute at UT Permian Basin for providing us this opportunity. Thank you so much, Mr. Rivera. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nana. Have a good All day right. and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to your group. All right, take care.